Hey, everybody out there in the internet lands. Um, welcome to fans.com uh, and photos with stories. Uh, this is my talk show where I talk to photographers or people involved with photography. And um, been super fun to bring all of these projects to you. Um, the one we're doing today is a little bit bittersweet um, because we're going to be talking about the photography of Neil Casal. And of course, Neil is our dear friend who we lost about 11 months ago. Um, and uh, many people didn't know that Neil was such a um, prolific and incredible photographer. And um, one of Neil's last wishes uh, was that a book be made of his photography that he has been uh, working on for since I think the late 1980s, uh, 1997, 1998, in that range. So I've got a screen up here um, the other thing is, is that we just launched the Neil Casal Music Foundation. The website's right there, neilcasalmusicfoundation.org. Um, and this was put together by Gary Waldman. Gary is uh, one of Neil's oldest and dearest friends. He was his manager for his entire career. And uh, Gary has sort of spearheaded uh, this um, process of bringing to life the foundation. I think Neil is going to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Gary is going to join us at the end of this presentation when we get into the Q&A, which is a reminder that we do questions from you folks. Um, we have Harrison uh, in the background and he's searching all the websites and places where this is broadcasting on Facebook pages. And so put your questions in there and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, on today's program, uh, we have a bunch of people that were intimately involved with Neil on a photography level. Um, we have Piper Ferguson, we have Liz Pepin Silva, we have Laura Heffington, we have Christy Coleman, and we have my daughter, Ricky Blakesburg. I'll introduce more about them uh, as we get to their sections where they're going to talk. I'll introduce and give you more background info. Um, first, I got to just do a few, few little things. Of course, I got to thank all the people that helped put this together behind the scenes. We got Will Schwerd and Harrison and, and uh, Jonathan Healy and Steph May and Pete Shapiro, Brad Tucker. Those are the people at the Capitol Theater and the Brooklyn Bowl and Fans.com and Relics Magazine. And they're, the, they're our hosts and they're the people that make this happen for me. Um, and I'm very grateful to them. And I also just want to point out that Neil really is family with all of those people that I just mentioned. You know, the Cap, Lockin, the Brooklyn Bowl. Neil played at all those places. And he really, and I like to say, I'm not saying he was family. He is family. He will always be family. And uh, it's hard to not talk, you know, to, to remember to talk about Neil in the present tense because he is still always with us. So I want to continue to say that he is here. He is with us. He is family. Um, sorry, I'm gonna like, I know we're all gonna I get know, choked up a little bit, so um, so I apologize for that. Uh, there's some other people to thank here. Um, Michelle August helped put together the foundation website, <clears throat> she's intimately involved in the in the foundation and and putting this forward. Uh, Dave Schools wrote the forward for this book. Dave is a dear friend of Neil's, a dear friend of mine, and, and many of us. And uh, he played music with Neil and there's a record being made, a tribute record, and Dave is producing that. So sorry, I'm still a little choked up here. Um, and uh, Francie Green was the book designer. Francie's worked on book projects with me and uh, she designed this book with grace and sensitivity. So I just want to thank Francie for, for, for doing this. Um, I'm going to take a, take a deep breath here and drink of water. Um, sorry about that. I just jumped up to go get tissue. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna need to do that also. I, I think um, I didn't I didn't think that would happen, but obviously it is. So, um, you know, Neil as a photographer was was incredible. Um, you're gonna love this book. And again, I just want to go back. Uh, there's a Kickstarter campaign that we started to launch this whole foundation. Um, and if you just go to Kickstarter.com and search Casal, you'll find it immediately. It's it's incredibly well funded already but we need more because the foundation is going to do really, really good things. Um, the foundation is going to provide music lessons and, and, and musical instruments for kids in the area where Neil grew up, which is North Jersey and, um, and uh, um, lower New York state. And so uh, we're raising money for that. We're going to donate money to backline.care, which is mental health for musicians and, and support staff, um, please check out backline.care, also a very important organization. Um, music Cares. And uh, one of the things that 
this found, this Kickstarter is going to do. It's going to pay for the coffee table book and it's going to pay for this record to get made. And uh, it's going to keep Neil's work alive in, in front of all of us. So um, as a photographer, uh, Neil was influenced by a whole host of people. Um, Lee Friedlander and, and Gary Winogrand were street photographers that shot mostly in black and white. Uh, William Eggleston and Stephen Shore were the people that sort of brought um, color photography to the masses on an art level, right? It's, they were the people that made, made it okay for color photography to be art. Right. And what Neil has been doing for all these years is art. And of course, there's people like Robert Frank. Um, and uh, um, and then, of course, in the music space, there's there's Jim Marshall, uh, who we talked about last week on this program. And so um, Neil was influenced by a lot of these photographers. And uh, and I think it's important when we're looking at this work for you guys to take the time and actually go look at some of these photographers work online and you'll see those influences in Neil's work. It's really, really apparent. And then on the surfer side, um, uh, Liz, was it Ron Stoner? Was that his name, the surf photographer? Uh, so thank you. Um, some tissues, which I needed for sure. <laughs> Um, so Ron Stoner was a surf photographer that Neil was influenced by. And the thing that's so funny is that, you know, Neil and Liz is going to talk about Neil and his surfing because that was sort of her world with Neil. Um, uh, and surfing was so important to Neil is that we look through thousands of photographs of his in the surf world. And there's like a handful of actual people in the ocean on a surfboard. It's just the vibe surrounding it. So like any good documentary photographer, um, uh, Neil um, covered the scene extensively beyond just a guy on, on a wave or a girl on a wave in a tube or whatever, which is what we think of with surf photography. And so when, when Liz is talking about Neil and that aspect of his work, you'll see a lot of that work in what I'm talking about. Um, so in the presentation here, a lot of Neil's fans really became a, I wouldn't say that Neil really grew as a musician when he joined Ryan Adams and the Cardinals, right? And that's when he started to get a lot of fans. But before he played with Ryan Adams, he played with a whole lot of bands and he was this prolific songwriter. Um, Christy Coleman, who we're going to talk to first, is going to talk about the early days of, of Neil Cassell. Um, but a lot of you guys don't know that Neil was in a, a metal hair band. And here's some photos that his manager, Gary, sent to me. Um, if you look at these early photos, Neil with his Les Paul and his leather pants and his Converse and the, the cutoff sleeves. You know, we know Neil, uh, a lot of people know Neil from the jam band world, right? When he started playing with Chris Robinson and, and you know, Ryan and to Chris. And then, of course, O'Teal Burbridge and Friends and hardworking Americans and members of the Grateful Dead and stuff like that. And so a lot of people never got to see these pictures of Neil when he was in, um, uh, I think it was Blackfoot was a Southern rock band. And, and Neil's heavy metal band, um, right when he first started out was called Exire, E-X-I-R-E, <laughs> Exire, right? So, so Neil had this life. And of course um, his heroes were Keith Richards and the Rolling Stones and people like that. And, uh, but always, we always knew um, that Neil was a deadhead. Neil also had this, he knew how important Jerry Garcia was. And so when Neil finally got to um, uh, play with members of the Grateful Dead, it really took on a whole new life for him and a whole new meaning. Uh, I believe it was in 2008 at the Best Buy Theater uh, in New York City that he played with Phil Lesh for the first time. And I'm pretty sure I was there. Um, and, uh, and Neil was just so happy because, you know, that connection was building and building and started with Ryan Adams because Ryan was a dead end and there were some interactions and you'll see a photograph um, in here that, that he took. Um, this photograph here is one that I took of Neil Casal um, at Lock and Festival last August. And this is pretty much one of my last photographs I ever took of Neil. And this was also Neil's last show. Um, I took this shot and there's another shot which I didn't put in the presentation of a, a silhouette sunset shot of Neil, which is also at this same same show here a little bit past this shot and um uh and you can find that shot anywhere it's out there uh i went back to my office after this set that neil played and he played in front of 10,000 12,000 15,000 people they crushed it bob weir came up on stage uh um uh dwayne betts dicky betts's son played with them it was an incredible band krasno was on on stage and uh, the, the singers and horn players from Trey Anastasio's band, O'Teal, it was an incredible set. It was mind blowing. 
And, and Neil was always so nervous and had so much anxiety about being on stage, but he was so comfortable up there. You would never know it when he's playing in front of, you know, 10,000 people. And uh, so anyway, um, after I went back to my office and downloaded these photos, I put them on my phone because I wanted to text them to Neil. And I went to catering and I went in there and catering was closed. It was 8.30 exactly. And that's when they closed. And there was only three people in there eating dinner and Neil was one of them. And Neil finished eating, came over and sat at my table and we talked for 20 minutes. And, um, and I got his phone number because he had just recently changed it. And I texted him those photos. We talked about this particular shot and about how he knew I was crawling around behind his amp for five or 10 minutes. And he's like, he goes, I knew you were up to something. And then when he saw the silhouette shot, he knew that's what it was. He goes, I never know what to do. Should I smile? Should I frown? Should I put my guitar towards you? But he, he knew that something was going on is what he told me. And we talked about him playing with Bob Weir and how exciting that always was. And, uh, and then he left. And the next day he texted me a photo that he had taken at lock and of some people backstage, Bob, we are in O'Teal. And I think he texted that photo to like 10 other photographers from lock and cause that's the way Neil, Neil was. He connected with all of us. He'd be like, hey, look at the shot that I took but he would never brag about it, right? It was always so quiet, you know, what Neil was doing. And so on that note, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna pass this on to, um, oh, I'm sorry, hang on one more second here. So here's a few photos that I pulled out of the presentation to give you an idea of some of these photographers. So this is like right classic, right out of Stephen Shore or William Eggleston. And uh, uh, no people, a sign in color, old trucks, foreign auto parts with all American cars sitting there, like just classic, right? Same thing here, color, inanimate, um, you know, and this is again in that same vein. This could be Robert Frank. This could be Gary Winogrand and these street photographers. Um, this is a great shot that we loved and we didn't know who it was from. And we did the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, there was a woman who sent a message to Gary Waldman. And I think I can find it here real quick. And uh, she said, thanks for doing this. And by the way, the, the knuckle shot is uh, my best friend, Alicia Hanlon. And they went and saw Ryan Adams and the Cardinals in DC on October 30th, 2007, they were hanging out after the show and Neil couldn't resist photographing her knuckles, which is so classic. Um, again, this is just like right out of any of those classic street photographers shooting black and white. Same with this, Peter Buck from the band REM just sitting there backstage. Neil never asked anybody to pose for a photograph, right? Like me, I'm backstage and there's like three musicians in the room. I'm like, hey, you come over here, you come over here getting this photo. Like, I want a picture of the three. He would never do that. It was all just invisible. He was a fly on the wall. And that's what Neil always wanted to be. Peter Buck probably never knew this photograph was even taken of him. It was quiet, it was silent, it happened in a split second and he walked away. And he knows how important Peter Buck is to put contemporary pop culture and music. I mean, he's an REM founding member. Um, and this photo here, Dave Schools talks about in the forward that he wrote in this particular book. And I'll let you read that forward so you can hear what he did. But I also published this photo for Neil in a coffee table book that I did on the Locken Music Festival because it was such a great picture. And Neil was so excited to have a picture in that book. That's the way Neil was. It was just so simple. Wow, I'm being published in a book, a coffee table book. He was so excited. Um, his, one of his best friends, Joe Russo at Terrapin Crossroads. Again, such a candid moment. Uh, you know, this is Martha Wainwright backstage. Like this is right out of the book of Jim Marshall, the legendary photographer, not posed. You know, nobody knows this photo is being taken. She's working on a set list, obviously. It's just a candid moment that says so, so much. Um, these are some fans at a Jane's Addiction show, I believe it was. Uh, David uh, Rollins and Gillian Welch backstage. Again, simple, clean, just tells a story. Um, Phil Lesh and Ryan Adams from their very first meeting at the Jammies in New York City. Um, Love is Pain, again, like this is the quirky side of Neil, you know, like here's Adam drinking some, you know, liquor out of a paper bag, his good friend, you know, no local, everything about this picture is, is like almost Dan Arbus, but not, you know. Um, so again, all of his influences, this quirky shot, the red arrow pointing at the woman, um, uh, you know, in the red shirt and, uh, uh, you know, again, not making fun of anybody at anybody's expense. And Laura talks about that later. I don't know who this person is, but with these mannequins. Um, so on that note, let's get into Christy Coleman. I've spoken for long enough. Um, uh, Christy Coleman uh, is professionally, she's a very accomplished makeup artist. She uh, co-owns, co-started a company called Beauty Counter that sells makeup. 
um, when I read the, the afterword that she wrote in this book, uh, it brought me to tears. Um, she talked about going on photo shoots with people like Irving Penn for Vogue magazine. These are my big influences. Um, I was jealous when I when I read this about her, you know, working with these people that are legendary in my mind. And so, um, and of course, um, Christy was married to Neil Cassell. They were together from the time that Neil was 24 years old uh, for nine years. Christy was 26, and that would be 1992 to 2001. Um, and so this first photo is of Gary Waldman, who is Neil's oldest, dearest friends. Christy, take it away. And I'm going to flip through photos while you're talking uh, slowly. Um, and if you want me to go to a specific photo, just let me know. But here you go, Christy, it's all you. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I just want to say thanks to Jay um, and your daughter, Ricky, for putting this together. And of course, um, everyone that's on the um, on the Zoom call. Um, for me, it's been such a treat to go um, to see actually his life after us, after 92, when we um, weren't together anymore. But we remain friends, text all the time. And so it was very much you know, I was in the know of what he was doing, but I certainly was not looking at all of his photographs. And so um, that was the side of Neil that I actually really loved was the his artistic, his eye, obviously, because it's the industry I come from. But um, yeah, so it's been a real treat. And I think it's awesome that you have chosen to share all of these photos with everyone, because I definitely think they're worth seeing. The first photo is of Gary Waldman. He is Neil's very best friend and they have been inseparable. When I met Neil, I actually met him at CBGB's. Um, I, was going, I went to see a Texas band play and Gary was actually with him. And Neil and I like, you know, he, he came right in and we were talking and he started just like in Neil fashion, like, who do you listen to? Who's your favorite artist? That kind of thing. And so we bonded and then that was it. We were together, like you said, for nine years. Um, and during that time, like working, I was working as a makeup artist, starting off, he was starting, he was actually a singer songwriter. I didn't know Neil as this guitar hero that everyone knew him as. Um, I knew him as more of the creative songwriter. He, just like he carried his camera around, um, I think when he was really playing in these bigger bands, when we were together and he was, you know, a kid, he actually was carrying his guitar around in that way. And so songs were, I think at that time, his music um, or his creative outlet. And, so anyway, lots of self-portraits. We, um, I was shooting S at 70 at the time. And so Neil decided like, you know, he just, we were just like, we were all over New York City. We were grabbing, we were really into Dan Eldon um, and his scrapbooks that he did. You know, the, the kid from South Africa that was killed. We were into Robert Frank, a ton of Robert Frank books. And as you mentioned, William Eggleston. Um, and also um, Robert, um, Andrew Wyeth, the painter. Um, we were really into him and I remember Neil loved that Christina's world the painting as she's like staring in the distance at the barn and I when I look through these I see so many shapes you know that he you know that um are familiar to that to you know all those references but he had an eye like nobody like he'd take a picture the crop was perfect the shadow was perfect like you know, Neil could basically do anything. The one thing he really couldn't do was he was not great at like taking the trash out or any gardening or, but it, anything creatively, like he could just, I mean, he was awesome. We had so much fun together. Um, but anyway, self-portraits, he was doing it before there was like Instagram and selfies. Um, and you can see here in this one with the No Wish, um, his album there. Um, and then here he is in the studio. Um, this was when he was um, recording Fade Away Diamond Time in Santa Ynez, California. And so we all went out there um, and lived in this house for like three weeks. And there was a photographer that was a good friend of his and mine, this kid, Kevin Wells, that took really gorgeous photos. And I think Neil was super inspired by him too. Um, the next photo I love of this like stolen moment of these um, two, um, deeply in love. Then you go into like, you know, the girl leaning into the bar where I think that, um, you know, like I, I love that shot too. I think he just, he was really into um, capturing moments and, and um, 
you know, he had like a, a very solid, um, I'll start to cry too. So I have to like take breaths. I had to jump up and go get some toilet paper just in case. But, um, anyway, he was always like, you know, quietly, just like you said, you never, he never asked someone to take a picture or he just was always kind of drifting around. And he, I think in his stillness, he was able to see things that others couldn't because we're moving and talking and he just was always observing um, even when he was really young. I did meet him right at the edge, like right at the end of Blackfoot days. So it took a, he, he drifted into this like metal hair and lots of leopard. <laughs> um, anyway, into like a into a, a singer songwriter. I do love the one with the mannequins too that you chose um, in the wedding dresses and the, the, I think that's great. And then there's Guy Clark. We actually saw Guy, Guy Clark a few times, but the one show that we did see um, that meant everything to us was we went to see um, Guy and Towns Vant at the bottom line in the village. It was right, I mean, I think it was a couple years before Towns died and um, Guy had to help Towns, like he was falling off his stool and Guy and his wife would come out and try to help him and Neil was just so devastated by that show. There was no one in the theater. I think maybe we were one of two of 50 people. It was so empty. Um, and then there's this one and the, um, and the park love, the subways, all of these I love. Here is also too, maybe that's his um, zebra. Maybe he was thinking of XR when he shot that lady. Some more subway shots, what I think are incredible, just again, stolen moments. Um, another couple in love, which is great. Um, and more subway shots. And I always love like the shadows. Like if you look at the woman holding the bag, like her shadows from her feet that are going forward, almost like she's in motion, which I think is, is beautiful. And the guys, oh my gosh, like you couldn't have styled that. Um, that is just the best shot. I think it, it, it makes me, and I can hear him like beside me, like going, oh my, you know, like, so that is, I just get a big giggle. Then we get into like these kind of Americana shots and Neil and I were doing, he had a 67 Chevelle, and so we were driving from New York City to Texas, um, and I, yes, I got in that Chevelle and drove. It was very bumpy, but we pulled over all the time, and these, we did a whole series on road signs like this on SX-70, um, and so he is obviously emulating a lot of this, like, Americana that just, you know, driving around the truck, like, you know, the pickup truck, like this was all feels like we were driving across the, the West. And then of course, like the, the hotel rooms I love, like there was, you know, he shot a lot of SX seventies too of hotel rooms and sending notes and silhouettes again, um, vacuum cleaner. <laughs> he didn't vacuum. Um, and of course there's his mother, which is, I think, um, you know, that was his, I mean, they were nuts about one another. I mean, she was, she was, that was, she, Neil was her only son. He had siblings, but not with Barbara. Um, and so I think that's a, I just saw her recently and she's, you know, she looks beautiful there. Um, and then we have the traveling suitcases. So I think that's really ironic. And I think this group shot, it's interesting. I don't, you don't see many shots of groups of people. Um, it's usually environmental or just individuals. So I think this is really interesting because there's lots of, um, lots of people. I love this other one too, the old school, like Americana, the beach, and of course then the self-portraits, which, you know, that's, I remember lots of those self-portraits. I love the one in the, um, 18 wheeler just where as he's or maybe that's a bus to me it looks like an 18 wheeler do you know jay what is that it looks like it's a u-haul truck oh yeah or yeah u-haul or a u-haul <laughs> but anyway capturing himself in the window he did have the most gorgeous face though i loved photographing him because he had like the pretty eyebrows you know the makeup artist in me can't help a beautiful face so he was really fun to photograph too so i of course like love that photo 
So and there's, there's a book that Lee Friedlander did called In the Picture, Self-Portraits, and it's all photos and mirrors. So clearly he saw that series or that book or something because yeah. this is a constant theme uh, in, in his photography is uh, Neil himself in mirrors and other people in mirrors, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll see. Um, that was great, Christy. Thank you Thank so you. much for a little bit of insight into some of Neil's earlier days and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how an artist develops on a visual level. You know, obviously as a guitar player, he practiced, practice, 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 practice. He was prolific, he did that. Um, but he was doing the same thing with photography, but it wasn't, it, there was no public face to it yet at that point, right? So people didn't know about it. I mean, he had an exhibit in Japan much later on and, and uh, uh, Liz, I think, and him talk about that um, in some emails. Um, so we're going to jump into Liz here next. And um, so uh, Liz, Elizabeth Pepin Silva, um, Liz wrote the introduction for this book. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. Uh, there's a lot of sections that she broke out in this uh, introduction where she took emails that uh, her and Neil exchanged together and pulled some of the things that he wrote. So you can read some of Neil's thoughts and feelings on what was going on with mostly surf and photography. Um, you know, all of us here that are on this today have this through line of music with Neil. Every one of us has this music connection, but we also have this photography connection as well. And uh, as I get to each one of these people, you'll, you'll see and learn a little bit about um, each of that stuff. So um, real quick, so um, Liz, She's a filmmaker, she's a photographer, she's a writer. Um, she grew up in the Bay Area and she's a surfer. And uh, uh, she's been working on a project called Water Women for I think about 24, 25 years now, photographs of women and surfing. Uh, and again, something like that is so inspiring to somebody like Neil to see these long-term projects. She's been published over and over in newspapers and magazines. She's exhibited in museums and galleries. Um, and she really is the person that connected to this thing that Neil did for, I think, only about the last 14 years of his life, I think, um, which was surfing. And, uh, and this opened up a whole new world. When I first met Neil, I think he was just a couple of years into surfing at that point. Uh, and I remember we have a mutual friend, Tim Bloom, and the band The Mother Hips. I remember them making a date to go out and do some surfing. And Neil and, and Tim was a, a seasoned surfer at that point. And Neil was so excited to go out in Ocean Beach in San Francisco and, and surf with Tim. Uh, and so, um, Liz, on that note, I just want to real quick, uh, this is a, a little excerpt from one of the emails that Neil sent to you. And it said, I love photography so much, as much or more than music sometimes. There is nothing better than hitting the streets along with my camera. It's one of the most calming things I could ever do. All right, with that, let's give it over to Liz and, um, and Liz, uh, take it away. Well, thank you so much for having me be part of it. And yes, I've been uh, fighting back tears a few times during this already, so I apologize. Um, I met Neil in 2008 through my brother-in-law who, uh, at the time managed uh, Ryan Adams and the Cardinals. And I needed some music for a film about water issues that I was working on. And my brother-in-law suggested Neil. And first we connected because of music, but then when he found out I was surf a surfer, he was even more enthusiastic to <laughs> work on my project. And I think it was more because he wanted to talk about surfing then um, he wanted to actually do the music for my film. But over the course of our friendship, um, he was just so incredibly generous. I, I self-finance most of my films and he would only just have me char uh, pay for the studio time um, and he was never turned me down. It was just amazing. He'd be out on the road and he's like, don't worry about it. I got this. I'll send you, I'll record stuff in the bus and, and I'll send you stuff. So it was amazing. But it was really surfing that um, he loved talking to me about and surf photography as well. Um, I started shooting surf in uh, 1996, early 96. 
Uh, I'd been surfing since 86 when I was, uh, or maybe 85, I don't even know, 20, I was 21. Um, right before I was, became the day manager at the Fillmore Auditorium. Um, and so I had already been a surfer for quite a long time when I met Neil um, and had been shooting surf uh, for over 10 years. So I was one of the early women surf photographers and one of the few women that was actually focusing my lenses on women surfers um, and try and uh, give a, an alternative view to what was being seen in the surf magazines and in the surf industry, which if anyone has seen those images, they know they're usually of women in bikinis standing on the beach rather than women actually surfing and participating. And Neil was really intrigued by that and uh, loved that I was trying to do this alternative visual perspective as um, not only a photographer myself, but also as a, a woman surfer. Um, and so I, only, I not only shot um, or shoot still, from the beach with a long lens, a 600 millimeter lens, but also uh, swimming out in the water with a camera and a water housing. And Neil was just fascinated by that. He, he really wanted to try and see what it was like to shoot in the water, but strangely, he never actually uh, wanted to borrow my water housing. The closest we got was, I think it was a couple years into our friendship, um, when he first, when we first met, he was in Brooklyn. And then when he moved to Los Angeles and I was up in San Francisco, he would drive up, um, every month or so to come hang out and surf. And so it was, um, one of those trips that, um, he asked if I could bring, uh, some of my little point and shoot waterproof cameras, uh, that have a long strap that you wear across your chest and the camera rests in the small of your back. Um, and so we each had one and we paddled out and it was kind of a crappy day, um, which was par for the course because it seemed like every time we wanted to surf together, I would say 90% of the time the surf was crappy. Um, but we had fun and he was really excited about it. It was, he was so stoked to, because so much about water photography is also geometry. I mean, you have to think about where the wave is breaking and be at that right point where you're going to be right there in front of the surfer as they're coming down the line towards you. And then you usually at two or three shots in if you're lucky. And we're, we're shooting with film. We weren't shooting digitally at that time. Um, and then you have to duck under the surfer. You're going to get nailed in the head. So there's all this complicated stuff. And at the same time, you're getting moved by the ocean currents. And so he was like, wait, so you sit in, and, and, you know, and it's, it's a hard thing to explain, but if you're a surfer and a photographer, it actually really helps because then you can watch the surfer's movements and anticipate them. And as a photographer, of course, to know how to set up the shot. So we had a super fun time that day doing that. But strangely, as you can see in this first photo, um, which was taken up in Santa Barbara County, that was, um, his shots tended to be more that of an observer. And a lot of people who don't surf don't know this, but you spend a lot of time on the beach, getting ready, watching the waves, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And so this, uh, is one of the few places in uh, California where you can actually drive onto the beach. Um, I'm not gonna give very uh, detailed descriptions of where these places are because it's a tradition in surfing that you don't uh, reveal spots unless they're very, very well known, but anyone that surfs knows where this is. Um, and uh, it's hard to get to and Neil told me about this day and I was super jealous because at the time I had never been up there because to get access to it, you have to know somebody. So he told, he came back and told me after the fact that he had been and then showed me a few photos. So of course I was enormously jealous. Um, this next photo is actually taken in Southern Baja in Mexico. And this is a, very, very um, 
amazing place. As you can see, it's like a machine has set these waves off. It's uh, often like that. And my husband, Dave and I would go down to this spot a lot and tell Neil about it. And he's just like, oh, I gotta go, I gotta go. But you know, one thing about Neil is he was always in motion. He was always on tour. He was always producing somebody's record. He was, you know, doing this or that. So it was very hard for him to carve out time to get down to this spot. To get there, you have to drive for two days um, on some pretty gnarly roads. And so finally he had some time off and he went down to this spot in Mexico with a friend of ours who became a very close friend of his, almost like a father figure named Frosty Hessen. And they scored. And so this shot is taken from uh, looking through the window of his truck. He drove uh, his white beater truck down there. And actually when he got back, that truck was pretty much on its last legs. That's how bad the road is. Um, this is a photograph which, <laughs> sorry, um, is the last few weeks of our mutual friend Zeus' life. Um, sorry, uh, she's a like one, she was one of my best friends. Uh, when I met Neil and and started to tell him about uh, this very close group of surfers in Santa Cruz that my husband and I were a part of. Um, he really wanted to meet them. And so finally we invited him to come up to Santa Cruz and uh, come to Zoof and Frosty's house, uh, they're married. And he immediately bonded with both Zoof and Frosty and would actually come up there and visit them even if Dave and I weren't in town. So it was funny that um, he became as close to them as he, he was to both myself and my husband. Zoof had cancer um, for almost two decades. Uh, she got it when she was 30 and in 2015, it came back, sorry. <laughs> and she quickly went downhill and she loved Neil very much and felt so comfortable with him that he, she allowed him to photograph her in the last few weeks of her life. She felt it was important to capture that. And so this is Ashley Lloyd, who um, was Zeus next door neighbor. She's a former professional longboarder. Um, now she's one of the few women in the world that shapes surfboards and she's rubbing Zeus' hand. And I just think it's such a beautiful, it, it shows Zeus' spirit um, even in, in her final moments. Sorry. Um, I'm not sure where this photo is taken. I think it might be in New York. I'm not quite sure. I actually, um, got to photograph uh, once in on Long, at Long Beach Beach in New York. And it was because of Neil that I knew where to go. I happened to be back there uh, for my a film festival. One of my surf films was screening at the New York Surf Film Festival. And Neil, tra Neil had just left New York and I got there like a few weeks later. So he told me where to go. Um, and I was so grateful to him because I would have, have no idea. And I actually scored because um, there was a hurricane swell. And so usually New York surf can be pretty small, but on the day that I photographed, um, it was actually really good. So I'm grateful to Neil for that. Neil and I actually shared a love of black and white surf photography. And um, he is, uh, as influenced by early surf photographers, uh, Ron Church being one of them, um, and the black and white photography the, the, of the early surf photographers. So he shot black and white with his like as much as I did. Uh, this is a truck accident on the way uh, going down to Baja. Uh, Highway one runs from uh, the California border down to the tip of Baja and it's notoriously gnarly 
uh, drive. So Neil came across this accident. Um, this was a surf trip that Neil did to um, Hawaii. And this is the North shore of Hawaii. And I don't know whose house it is, but it's definitely some pro surfer because you can see on um, the shortboard there at the bottom um, resting on the grass that has a Quicksilver sticker um, in a place where a professional surfer would put a sticker. Um, this just captures moments of uh, what you do before and after surfing. Neil, um, as Christy mentioned earlier, he just had this way of seeing these scenes as they unfolded before him and without anyone realizing it, snapped photos of whatever was going on. And he definitely did that a lot with the Santa Cruz crew. And then when my husband and I moved down to Ventura County, um, he would be at parties and stuff. And then afterwards, send me these photos that I had no idea he had even uh, taken. It was amazing. Um, I think this photo is in New Zealand and he was super stoked because um, I think it was Ryan Adam and the Cardinals played New Zealand and then he decided to stay for a week afterwards and um, it, in Raglan, which is a pretty well-known surf spot. And he was so excited. He was by himself. He was really inspired by what he was seeing, had a great time surfing and had this little cottage um, very close to the beach. So I think that's the inside of the cottage where he stayed. Uh, this is a sunset um, in, reflected in his truck. Um, Neil loved to take self-portraits and these next few photos, uh, obviously he put the camera probably on a piece of driftwood or something and then stuck his board in the sand and put himself in the photo. I think it's really fun. It shows this playful side of Neil in his um, photos. This shot's in Ventura. Um, he loved living here. Uh, he loved the waves we had, we have, I mean, I still surf there this secret spot in Ventura that we would always, um, whenever he was in town, we'd go surf there. Uh, that's not this, where this photograph was taken, um, but he would often ride his bike down to the beach. Even if he didn't have time to surf, he'd ride down with his camera and just take pictures of whatever he was seeing. And again, parking lot shots, spend a lot of time in parking lots when you're a surfer. Um, his board, I think this, this really captures Neil in one photograph, his uh, music and his surfing and photography all in one. I love this shot, a uh, surf van. Uh, white surf vans are a staple in, in surf culture. I have one, many people have them. Uh, you can shove your boards in there, not have to worry about them getting stolen. You can sleep sleep in the car if you need to. So I think this this is one of the best surf van photos I've ever seen. There's some more surf vans. <laughs> um, so when there's no waves, uh, you can go skateboarding, skate culture, and surf culture are definitely um, uh, joined together. As you can see, this kid's... Uh, I think this is actually in Hawaii, uh, skating while there's no waves. Again, more Hawaii. This is another shot um, from that trip he took uh, with Frosty in Southern Baja. And he talked about just sitting on the cliffs and uh, watching the light change. It's, it's really dynamic down there to shoot. Um, it also can be really hard because wind comes up and your cameras just get hammered with sand being blown into them and salt water. Um, so this is a low tide shot. And this is a photograph of Frosty, um, who, like I said, was a father figure to uh, Neil. And as you can see, another white van stuffed with uh, surfboards and a bed. And um, it's a staple of, of surf life. And I'm not sure where this photo was taken. I think somewhere uh, south of Los Angeles. 
again, one of those surf photos where it's uh, those moments that, that only Neil seem to see that just turn out so beautifully. And I like the, the way the boards go one way and the towels going the other way. And I think that's Neil. Uh, Jay, do you think that's Neil? No, that? I don't think, no, it's not. I can't see very well, so. Yeah, no, it's, it's, not, it's not Neil. Okay. This was actually, um, one of Neil's most favorite uh, photos that he ever took. Um, I actually have a copy of it. He made a copy of it for me, uh, hangs on my wall. Originally it was actually a color shot, but um, when he took the photo, it's, it's a, it taken in Ventura. Um, he sent it to me and he's asked, which, wh which one do you like better? Do you like it black and white or color? And I've said, definitely color. I'm sorry, definitely black and white, <laughs> <laughs> my mistake, definitely black and white. And I think it really captures what we all go through as surfers, even though you can be surrounded by people in the water, it's actually a sport where you're, you're very by yourself in many waves. And I just think this is such a beautiful, dreamy, lonesome, um, poignant photo. Uh, it reminds me of Neil a lot for some reason. Um, I, I just love this photo so much. It's just, just, just gorgeous. What's really sad to me is that it see, it sounds like Jay, what we've talked about is that he did this whole body of work of the Santa Cruz crew um, and uh, other images that he, I have low res copies of that he would uh, text or email me over the course of our friendship. But it seems like a lot of those, unfortunately, um, have been lost to time for some reason. Is yeah, Neil's, yeah, Ricky will talk a little bit about that process when we get to her next, um, sort of the, the finding stuff and not finding stuff. Right. Um, so this is Mollusk Surf Shop. Uh, Mollusk was uh, started in San Francisco. Um, and uh, I know the guys that own it. Uh, this is actually uh, their Brooklyn uh, surf shop. Um, surf shops, uh, a lot of times in surf culture are this place of meeting. Um, Neil was super stoked to become friends with the manager of the one in Brooklyn. And I think that his friendship with the guys at Mollusk uh, really was a game changer for him. He met them about a year before he met me and he would go surfing with these guys even during snowstorms. I mean, he sent me photos, uh, which I actually haven't been able to find of him changing in parking lots in New York. In, and it's like two feet of snow on the ground and they're all hopping around <laughs> and getting ready to go out. It's, it's, being from California, it's way more hardcore than I could ever imagine. Um, but he just loved surfing so much um, that he would go out in any conditions. And so this is a photo of, of that store. Um, I think that Neil really needed surfing. It was a way as it is for myself and I think other surfers as well as Instead of you taking Prozac, you go surfing. It's a really amazing way to <laughs> uh, keep your mental health in check. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Liz. Appreciate it. Um, great insight into a whole other side of Neil's life and how all of these things merge. Like that one shot you were saying, the the uh, audio cables and uh, you know breakout box for audio stuff and his surfboard and whatnot was just you know it, it is the combination of those three things that I think were probably the most important things in Neil's life: his music, his surfing, and his photography. All right. So next up. I get to introduce my daughter, Ricky Blakesburg. And um, Ricky, when I first started talking to Gary Waldman about doing this project, I had mentioned to him that I was gonna have my daughter help go through the bins and bins of photographs. And so a um, little background on Ricky. So she is a photographer, a fine art photographer. She studied photography in college. Um, she's a photo editor. She's a curator of photography. Um, she's obviously been around photography her whole life because of me. Um, and uh, 
a couple things happened. She started looking at these photographs around just before Thanksgiving, I guess, because she was home. And then um, Corona, COVID-19 hit and she did an extended stay. And so she took on a much larger role in this project and really became the creative director working with the art director with Francie Green, who we talked about earlier. And um, so uh, Ricky, why don't you tell us a little bit about your process, about how you made some decisions on what you wanted the look and feel of the book to be like in terms of fonts and layout and you know clean versus cluttered, things like that. And, uh, and that direction that you gave to Francie to then go out and make this come alive and talk about maybe some of the different sections in the book and how you came up with those ideas. And, and uh, you know, how did this start for you and, and how did it, you know, unfold over the course of about seven months? Yeah, well, this journey really started, like you said, in November when we went and met um, Dan Horn and Adam McDougall at the chapel in San Francisco, where they handed us about like 10 big bins of, uh, what are those envelopes called, Dad? The, you know, the just like manila, just uh, mail. Yeah, envelope. like yellow envelopes filled with thousands of negatives of Neil's. And we took them home and, you know, I was so eager to immediately dive in and just sift through them. And um, we were able to curate such a beautiful book, but, you know, it took a lot of time to go through and find all of these photos. So my process really started when I sat down and started going through each of these bins and going through these folders and the folders were labeled usually just by date. So, you know, I think that most of these folders Unfortunately, they started in 1999 and, you know, Neil started shooting in 92. So we didn't have a lot of those photos from before then. But, you know, I started by going through these yellow envelopes that had packs of negatives. And I began just by picking my favorite ones. And from there, um, my dad and I started to, you know, gather the photos that we felt best represented what... Neil had shot and the biggest thing for me was my relationship really started with Neil after his life I had met him several times with my dad before but my journey with Neil really started after where I spent months looking through his eye in this intimate way looking through thousands of his photos which was beautiful and an opportunity that I'm so honored and thankful that I got to have I um got to really spend time looking through his eyes and through the help of his Instagram and Facebook and blogs, I was really able to capture the aesthetic of um, what I felt best represented what Neil would have wanted. And I think it was good because I got to really look at this from an objective point of view, not knowing Neil prior. I really went into this, not looking at it so much emotionally, but really from a perspective of what would Neil have wanted and what was consistent in each of these image, images that he took. So I don't know, Dad, if I need to go through every yeah, Let me ask you a couple of questions. So, so you divided the book up into sections and I believe yeah. it's, uh, what are those sections again? Um, I'm not gonna say them exactly in order, but it's humans, road, travel, surf, and music. And we did like you, I think you mentioned this earlier, we did have a self section because Neil, you know, before it was called the selfie, he did a lot of self portraits in the mirror, but we decided to sort of put those throughout the book. Um, but we basically, I chose those sections based on sifting through all of these images and sort of gathering them together because, you know, Neil traveled so many different places. He was in Japan, it felt like almost every year. And he had all of these photos from Japan and being on tour in Japan. And he had all these photos from being on tour in Europe. So it felt right to be able to gather these things, you know, whether he was on tour in a car or by plane, I don't know, it felt right to sort of group these things together, um, sort of like that. And, and then I also, um, and you, you, you're, you didn't mention this, but a lot of, so every, whenever Neil shot film, when he would get that film developed, he would also get a disc back with those low res JPEGs. And I think that was one of the first things you did. You went through piles and yeah. piles and piles of discs. You yeah, know, and, I, yeah. Stuff, and then you had to go back and find the negative that corresponded. So, yeah, so, you know, Neil first and foremost was a musician and I think that photography was a hobby he took on. And unfortunately his way of filing wasn't the most organized. It was sort of interesting. It felt like a little bit of a scavenger hunt 
because I would get these discs and I would find these photos that I loved or I noticed that Neil loved that he would put on his blogs very consistently. And then I would finally find the folder and I would have that photo and I'd be so excited because it'd be on the disc. And then I would go to the negatives and the negative, that specific negative wasn't there because what Neil liked to do was he would take the negative strip. And for those who don't know about film negatives, it, you, when you bring it in and get them developed, they usually cut them up into how many photos, Don? Eight? Fives or sixes. Fives or sixes. And he would cut the individual photo out of that negative and then he would put it into a different folder. And that folder was called favorite negatives of 2001. So then I would think I found the negative that I was looking for to scan for the book. And then we would be sent on a whole new journey into finding the negative all over again. So it actually turned into a happy journey because it ended up helping me find so many more beautiful photos that I think I wouldn't have found if it was just handed to me. You know, Neil sent me on a scavenger hunt through his life for that and so, time. And so you looked at like 10,000 plus images and you narrowed it down. And I think we scanned about 350 images. And yeah, we 150 and, digital, yeah. Right, because, uh, uh, and I think Liz talks about that in her essay that the, the transition from film to digital for Neil was a little bit difficult and he didn't really yeah. tap into it the same way that he did with film. And so I believe about 75% of this book is film versus 25%, maybe even 20% that's Yeah, digital. definitely. All right, and so Ricky, do you wanna, let's go through some of these photos yeah, and let's go talk a little bit them. about what you think about these. Yeah, um, I mean, let's, we can start with this one. I think that this was shot in Japan, right? The mirror, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like I said before, this was a classic Neil shot of him finding a mirror and capturing it. And this one is so beautiful in particular. I love that he captured this man and the other mirror on the side. I think it's just someone who was in a passerby and he was able to capture it. And I think it's such a unique, beautiful shot. Um, and as we kind of go on, I don't know. Um, sorry, let me keep going. I mean, Dad, you can start kind of scrolling through and we can talk briefly. I don't think I need to talk about every single one. Sure. A lot of religious icon stuff that he loved to shoot. Yeah, and he loved, you know, I loved that he would be on the subway and he would get these intimate shots of subway riders. You know, if you go to this man with the bow tie, um, he's obviously looking at Neil. And, you know, I'm sure Neil didn't say anything to him. It seems in most of Neil's photos that he and Christy, you had mentioned this earlier, he just sort of captured these photos on the go. It's not like he was posing, asking anyone to pose for him. It was very much street photography, flea of the moment. And I think that's what makes so many of these shots so beautiful is that they are such temporary moments. And um, that's something that I really loved about Neil's aesthetic um, and something I tried to really keep consistent throughout the whole entire book. Uh, this next shot of the boots I think is so beautiful. Uh, it's clearly, I think, on a tour bus of some sort. Or those aren't Ryan Adams shoes, are they, Dad? I don't know. Um, and then this next shot of this sleeping bag next to all these amps. This showed up a lot in Neil's blogs and Instagrams. I'm sure people have seen it before. But I love this shot. It has this fleeting moment to it as well. It seems like he slept there and was writing and reading. And then he got up and captured the moment before he packed it up and moved to the next spot. Uh, Neil loved to capture beds. I, I had hundreds of bed shots that we had to narrow down. He would often capture beds that were either made or already slept in from the next morning. And they were just so beyond beautiful. And like, I keep going back to just pleading, you know, like, it seemed like Neil was always on the move in so many of his photos because of music and being on tour. So it was a way for him to capture these moments and make them last a little longer. And I think that they are just so beautiful and have so much emotion to them. Um, having these beds that were slept in, but now are empty. Um, these next, next two shots are two of my favorite. Um, in the desert. I think that they capture so much color and they're actually right next to each other in the book too. So dad, I don't know if you are yeah. between the two, but um, 
Neil was really great at capturing these buildings. And I feel like for me, for some reason, this sort of has like this surfer aesthetic to it, even though it's in the desert, it still like creates sort of this beachy moment. And I think that that's something really consistent throughout all of Neil's photos as well. Same with this shack. Um, similar to the beds, Neil would capture so many um, motels and hotels. Um, and he, he would just take these beautiful shots uh, that were so unique and had such beautiful lighting. It felt like cinematography. It felt like these these stills from these different vintage movies like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas um, also has sort of like these Wes Anderson feels, which is just so beautiful. Um, from spending as much time as I did on these photographs, he spent so much time in Japan. I mean, we could probably make an entire book of just his Japan photos. They are so extraordinary and it was so beautiful because he definitely had a group of friends there. And from the time he started going there, I think I started seeing them in 1999 to 2010, you would watch these group of friends that he would capture and his friends, you know, you saw them 10 years. So they were 10 years younger and they grew older. And it was just so beautiful to see these friendships that he formed. And you know, I was just sort of like taking all of this in from these photographs. I was allowing Neil to tell me these stories through his eye. And it was something so unique and beautiful that I got to experience looking through each of these photos. Uh, this is my dad's favorite photo, the lady in the pink jacket on the street. Um, I actually think this is one of the photos in the Kickstarter that's available to purchase. Um, so beautiful. He was so great at capturing street photography um, of people on the move and fashion. I mean, like, look at this woman. She's so awesome and cool. And it feels like it could have been taken in the 50s almost. Um, some more street photography. And then I don't know if this is someone, this man in the cowboy hat and Christy, maybe, you know, or Gary, but um this older man, and then their last photo of, uh, there's another photo of an older man. I'm not sure if he had relationships with these men. They showed up a few times um, in the negatives that I would go through, but they felt very intimate. And these definitely felt like more of a photo shoot rather than a fly on the wall moment. So I'm curious about those, but they're very beautiful and I love them. Some more Japan shots. And then we go back into sort of a bed series, which I think, like I said, was amazing. He was great at capturing the light um, and the intimacy of what it was like to be on tour and sort of on the move with these clothes on his bed. And, you know, I mean, all of the things that I'm saying, like I said, I my relationship with Neil really started after... Um, his life had ended and I had to just take everything in and sort of learn from what I could from these images and I had Gary and my dad sorry something just happened I had Gary and my dad to um, help me through the journey of learning some of these stories but I'm just forever grateful that I was able to go through all of these photographs um Dad, do you have anything that you want to say about the rest of these photographs? Uh, let's see here. I love the, the shot of the Neil Cassell poster um, somewhere in Europe, which is, which is great. And that's what we used to open the music section. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, like here's a shot of a performer on stage, you know, like myself or Piper or Laura shooting a live concert, you know, would probably want to see their face, you know, and like to Neil, it's just art. It was just about like this photograph is as much about that woman in the audience yeah. looking at it than it is about the person on stage and it's just one of those moments it was yes, very much about the aesthetic it was less like you said about capturing like live music photography he was creating fine art in all of his photographs which i think is very key to this book you know like we decided to make a smaller music section because that's not what neil's photography was about it was about so much more than that 
Farmer Dave and Jonathan Rice when they were on tour with, uh, I think they were opening up for REM or something like that. I forget, Farmer Dave. Tell me a little bit about this shot, which we saw earlier when um, yeah. Liz was talking. This is the cover of the book. And Tomorrow why did you yeah. choose this? How did you gravitate to this? What, what, tell me a little bit about this. Um, this was one of the, this is the, one of the first shots that I saw when I started going through his negatives. And immediately when I saw it, I sent it to you, dad. And I said, this is the cover of the book. Um, I think that this shot is so emotional. The fact that Neil is in the car and he's looking through the window and he's looking at this surf and the water and this man walking with this surfboard. And it goes back to what Elizabeth was saying of, you know, surfing was something that was so therapeutic for Neil. And from the stories that I've heard, it's something a lot that he longed for that he maybe didn't have time to always do. And I think him, you know, looking through his lens with the necklace sort of in the wind and looking out, it just says so much and it aligns so well with, um, the title of the book tomorrow's sky it really feels like he's looking out and something really beautiful that actually happened with this photo was in i think maybe february my dad and i were visiting um a friend's house when we were in florida pre-covid and we were walking they were giving us a tour of the house and this was a framed photo in this house and neil like rarely ever printed or signed photos and randomly our friends had this neil castell photo hanging on their wall framed and signed by him and it was sort of this like cosmic moment where me and my dad looked at each other and we were like what like this is so beyond random and beautiful you know like we thought that this photo was a secret but you know it, it meant more to him and to other people than we we even knew so it was just like a really beautiful cosmic moment that happened and I think that this photo really embodies a lot of what the book Tomorrow's Sky um, is about. And then this last photo, just classic, the woman's hand with the cigarette yeah. in the glass, just so Neil. And like also just takes on that cinematogra like cinematography feel, you know, it feels like it's a moment out of a movie. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was just really beautiful. And mm -hmm. I'm so honored that I got to be a part of this experience. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone who trusted me to do this. It was a really wonderful and unique and beautiful experience. And thank you to Neil. Thanks, little Ricks. All right. Awesome. Next up, um, we've got Laura Heffington. And um, so Laura originally um, met Neil in 1996. And I believe they met through Laura's dad, who's a professional musician, played drums with Lowell George and Lone Justice and a whole bunch of other people. And I think that um, uh, her dad and Neil recorded together. Um, and I think Laura said that was a, just more of a casual meeting and they became better friends when he moved to California in the year 2000 um, or in the year 2000, I'm not sure if that's when he moved there. Uh, but Laura is, um, she's a Renaissance woman. She's a photographer. She does commercial photography. She does fine art photography. Um, she's a writer. She's an editor. She's a publisher. Um, she does a whole bunch of other, uh, uh, creative things. Um, that's just sort of, you know, right in the wheelhouse of Neil, which is why you can tell that somebody like Laura and Neil would, would be attracted to each other as friends because they had so much to talk about and so much in common. And uh, Laura was really kind of learning photography uh, about the same time that Neil was trying to learn photography. And um, uh, so I think that Laura became uh, the person that Neil could go to for a lot of tech questions. And even though Laura was still learning for herself, maybe she was better at, you know, getting on the internet or getting a book and, and, and answering questions about f-stops and shutter speeds and, and film speeds and things like that. Um, but in Laura's essay that she wrote, so Laura also wrote a short essay that's in this book, and everybody that's on this Zoom has written something. Ricky wrote a small little piece. I wrote a small piece. Uh, obviously, Liz wrote the introduction, which is long and beautiful, and Christy wrote the afterword. Um, but this is something that Laura wrote and that I'm going to read here real quick. It said, we had a conversation once about how photography isn't, exact, isn't exactly capturing the moment. It's about building something out of visual pieces of reality about making choices. It's more than good timing. There are countless possibilities for what to put in and what to leave out. 
the photos Neil took weren't just scenarios he happened to catch when he saw them, they were his voice. And that just rings so true about an artist and someone that is working so hard to take photography way more seriously than, oh, I've got a point and shooter, you know, the way we all are today with our, our phones and, and turn it into an art artistic pursuit and actually come out on the other end and create a body of work as to what we're showing you in these photographs. And so, um, uh, Laura, thanks for joining us. And um, uh, why don't you jump in and talk a little bit about, you know, your relationship with Neil and um, what you thought about his photography and your early journeys together as photographers and sort of um, figuring this all out and uh, sort of both becoming these, these um, renowned, very creative photographers. Hi, thanks so much for having me on your, first of all. Um, of course. I really appreciate just being involved in this. And I'm really happy that these pictures are coming to light and especially that a book is being made in sort of more of a fine art context um, because he did make another book mostly focused on music stuff. And I really think he was a great photographer um, just above and beyond documenting musicians, which he was also great at. But so I'm glad this is happening and I'm glad I got to be a part of it. Um, so yeah, basically uh, my dad, Don Heffington was playing drums on one of Neil's records. That's when I met him in the nineties. And, uh, and then he moved to Los Angeles. I think it might've actually been 2001 if I'm lining it up with what Christy was saying. But um, one of the first things that we started talking about was that I had been my grandfather was a photographer and I had his Nikon FE and a couple of his books and uh, had been really obsessively trying to learn <clears throat> how to use a manual camera. And Neil was, uh, he was really interested in that because everything he'd been doing was point and shoot stuff or Instamatic stuff. Um, and so he said, I wanna, you know, I wanna check that out. And uh, so I gave him some lessons um, just to show him the technical part of how to use a camera. I actually wasn't using the internet. It was like library books that I was getting or these couple of books that, that my grandpa had. Um, and so there, yeah, there, there wasn't just this kind of universally available internet resource the way that there is now where you just go, oh, let's, you know, look up how to take a picture, you know, in a, with a reflection, um, with a flash, whatever. And so, so I was telling him a lot of that stuff that I'd been working with. And um, he definitely talked about some of his influences up to that point, definitely Robert Frank, Jim Marshall with the music stuff. Um, and so we, uh, he ended up living in Highland Park where I still live. We were living a few blocks from each other. And we ended up just kind of experimenting with stuff a lot and going to the lab. And um, so this first picture, the Set Me Free mural, that's around here. Uh, so I'm not sure actually if it's survived the, the gentrification wave, but um, that's a mural. I had shot a band there for some publicity photos and um, it's just such a it's just such a great wall and the colors and I remember him this was a pretty early one of him messing around with the manual camera I remember he was you liked how that one had come out um, and then this typewriter one that's cool the stuff on the table the next couple of pictures are the inside of his house in Ventura um, and then there's a there's another bed after that. And the, the main thing that I think of when I see all the bed photos, um, and it may sound a little like I'm reaching, but I think there's something to it. Neil had a, a hard time showing people his inner world, I think. And he seemed so laid back and open and he's the kind of guy that people would just tell their whole life story to and then maybe later find out that there were huge swaths of his life that they actually didn't know much about. It was hard for him to open up even though he wanted to. And, uh, and so to me when I see these pictures 
of, of his house or these beds, particularly if the pictures are sort of um, messy or there's a lot of stuff sitting around. He was also very uh, kind of fastidious and tidy. I, I don't know if he was like this back in the, in the Christie era, but I don't think I ever saw Neil not make his bed. And I feel like those pictures were a way of letting, letting people in like making that decision to show people these private rooms and beds are, are very, uh, they're a very intimate thing. You know, they're very vulnerable things happen in beds. And so I think that's significant that he did that so much. Um, and then moving down, we've got the, yeah, really cool color one with the chair, just such beautiful colors in that. And, uh, and then the dresses hanging here against the tile another nice color one. Um, I, was, I was thinking about also influences and in sort of where ideas come from. And uh, we looked at a lot of books of photographers and talked about what we liked or why, you know, why is this picture good or what don't we like? And, um, and I remember him, he would get books on tour and bring them back and we would talk about them. And, and I remember him getting a Stephen Shore book, I remember just looking at, at an Eggleston book, but I was also thinking about the way that um, some of those things, I feel like were showing up before he, he necessarily got so into analyzing uh, Stephen Shore or Eggleston or Lee Friedlander or people like that. Um, I feel like some of it, maybe, I think we've all had the experience of like having an idea and then and then having it turn out that sort of that's that's also somebody else's thing. Um, and I, I feel like he was such a perfectionist and he he got so into doing things correctly um, with playing music and with photography that to some degree taking these really simple sort of vernacular pictures that maybe aren't in a conventional sense what a lot of people would take. I think I think to some degree that's like can be a reaction to trying to take perfect pictures, trying to take the kinds of pictures that, that a lot of documentary style photographers would take. I, I, I feel like those, that was showing up in his work, at least before we were talking about, uh, about the Stephen Shore stuff. I, I, I know he, he was aware of those things, but that seemed sort of organic to me as well. Um, there's another unmade bed, classic. Uh, laundromat one is really, really great, another one of those, those candid uh, photographs. Um, the wig store, that's a, that's, that was a beauty supply shop on Figueroa, kind of the main street over here in Highland Park. Um, just a funny picture and shows his, I think, sense of humor and it's got kind of a wry quality to it. And just to notice those details and pull those out, things that, that other people might just just pass by or not think we're worth taking a picture of. You'd see that, uh, and then the yeah the hotel the hotel sign. There's a lot of that's kind of a theme for him with all the traveling. Um, this next sign with the living rooms and dinettes. That's another interesting composition and good colors there. The Fisherman's Park. That's kind of a funny one. Um, I can imagine him. I think I remember him showing that to me actually and uh, thinking that was kind of just a funny thing. And this, this roadside sign, the chop shop. I think Neil was always out of town, um, even as musicians go, even as uh, session musicians or, you know, people that tour with other people all the time. He was really gone all the time. And um, when people are touring, it's a job. It's not, it's not like going on vacation. It's pretty demanding. There's not a lot of free time. It's like plane to a bus, to a hotel, to a sound check, back to the hotel, to the show. And, um, and he worked really hard at that. And I think that being able to take a minute and uh, just go out into wherever he was and grab some pictures like he always did it's, it's kind of it's kind of like a way of of connecting himself to the place where he was. He wasn't going to be there for very long, and and also um, 
I think being on tour all the time like that, as interesting as it is and, and all these great opportunities that it gave him to see all these things, also is kind of isolating or compartmentalizing. And, um, and so I think, I think he, it was a way for him to sort of connect to wherever he was before moving on. Um, yeah, this, this little church building, it's really great, another, another road. Uh, and we get into the Japan pictures. Um, he did spend a lot of time in Japan. He also, I think, was, was sort of peaking um, with his photography with the, with the manual camera at this point. He, I think he'd switched to the Leica when, when, when I was showing him how to use a camera. He had a Nikon FG, but I think at this point he'd gotten the, the Leica M6, which is uh, what I think Jim Marshall used and Robert Frank used, maybe Eggleston, I'm not sure. But, but I know this was a period where he was very prolific. He was really, I think it was really happening for him at this time and he felt, he felt good about it and was excited and, and would show me all these pictures and, and, um, and it was a really good time for him. Um, this guy on the, on the train, that's, a, that's a, another great, sort of uh, people in transit photo, a lot of those. Uh, woman with the baby. Yeah, this is another sort of funny one. Uh, the, the Coke guy with the giant hot dog, that's kind of a, that's kind of a Egglestonian one maybe, or a Stephen Shore type thing. Um, this panhandler on the, on the one-way sign. Again, a nice composition a thing that maybe a lot of people would overlook. And um, this woman in the plaid coat, this makes me think of uh, just the way that he would spot things that stood out about people, um, but it never felt exploitative to me. It never felt like it was at anyone's expense. It didn't feel like he was um, laughing at people. Uh, it, it felt very sympathetic and like he was with whatever was happening and connected. Um, he was a really sensitive person. I think that also connects to why he was such a good musician in support of other people's projects, just being, being adaptable and uh, perceptive and being able to sort of fall in with whatever was happening in a quick intuitive way. And so, I think he was able to sort of connect with what was happening with people in a quick glance in a way that was unique to him. And also this um, picture of the woman in the heels, the same, same sort of vibe. Um, and the, the, the wheelchair and the stroller here, it's kind of a, yeah, that's another good well, commentary on it's such a commentary on old and young. You know, you start in the stroller, you end up in the wheelchair. I mean, it's right, right. So that's so Robert Frank, so the Americans, um, such a such a there's so much going on in there. Um, it just tells such a big story. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Um, and also another another one kind of along those lines, the uh, the guy sitting down with the umbrella. Um, that's another great one. And I think, uh, I don't know, I just, I just, I think he was really good at, um, he was really good at the photojournalistic candid stuff. Um, I think partially because he wasn't that comfortable being in the spotlight. He wasn't somebody that became a musician because he wanted to be in front of people. Um, I don't think that, I think that was something that actually made him a little nervous. I know when he was doing his solo stuff, uh, he would get stage fright and, and, and it was difficult for him. I know he felt more comfortable, um, backing other people up, being part of other people's projects. And he was so, he was so great at that. And, and I think the fact that this type of photography requires blending in and becoming invisible, I think that appeals to him. 
just not, you know, not being front and center like that. This this next shot here of them on the beach, these people sitting on the beach, this is another thing that you wrote in your essay about his photographs. His photographs were kind and compassionate, and they were sometimes funny, but never at the expense of his subjects. And I think that's a really important statement, you know, with a photograph like this, like some people would be like, oh, look at, you know, look at these people, you know, middle America, whatever their comments might be. But again, that's not what Neil was looking for. He's not looking to get a reaction saying these people are funny or these people don't represent who, you know, the people I hang out with or anything. It was just this thing that he saw that was interesting and the color and the shapes and the umbrellas and the you know, everything about it. And again, it's a fleeting passing moment. I think that's even maybe his finger on the lens in the bottom left-hand corner of that photograph. So he's just walking by and doing this in a split second. Yeah, he's sort of sort of a, a conduit for whatever was going on. He wasn't, I, he didn't have like a concept that he was um, putting out, I don't, I don't think for people, the way that some photographers will set things up and kind of have a, have a, a, a statement that they're trying to make. I feel like he was just really trying to show whatever was happening at that moment. Um, and that, that changed according to whatever was going on, what he would pull out to people on the beach. Oh, I love this one of the, uh, the woman with the scarf on her head and all the leaves. I like how she's right in the middle of the frame, which is kind of, uh, it, it's a kind of a specific choice because a lot of times with, with your, with, you know, composing for photographs, you actually offset people and rule of thirds type thing where you put, put certain things along certain lines to, to break a picture up. Um, I think it's a very conscious choice to put something in the middle like that with the trees on either side, balancing it, it's like symmetrical. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sort of framing that. there. Um, yeah, the guy on the stairs. There's a Dr. John. I like the way he shot that through the the mic stands. That's the thing with doing doing music photography. There's always a mic stand in the way um, mm -hmm. or some other sort of equipment. You have to figure out how to get around that because you don't. You definitely don't want anything in front of somebody's face. So I like the way he did that there. Um, and uh, yeah, these these music ones that was that was obviously his other his other big thing and being able to being able to see these things from the outside as well as being part of them i think is a is a, an interesting perspective yeah these um, shots of um i have the one up of billy gibbons from zz top and farmer dave in the background and i believe this is taken at mollusk um oh. and, and and so here again is that surf uh, music photography thing all kind of colliding in one spot. And I think the, uh, there's an, another Jackson Brown shot that was shot at the Mollusk. But uh, back to you on the shot of Graveoff and, and Brad Pemberton from Ryan Adams Band playing chess, again, showing the boredom of tour. But go, go for it, Laura. Yeah, no, that's another, that's a great one. The way there's just those, those cinder blocks in there and it, it looks so temporary and they've just like, oh, let's play chess. Set this up right here. Um, uh, that's that's uh, that's really cool. Um, we're not sure if this next one is the back of Ryan Adams or the back of uh, is it Graveoff? We were yeah. wondering about. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think we've determined that we're we're pretty sure it's Ryan. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. And then you were saying, yeah, I'm not sure. I kind of I'm not sure exactly, but I, that's I think that's from that from that period. Um, Nora Jones here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then. Watson twins, that's a great photo. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't, I don't remember what you were, were you saying something before about where this next one is, the outside? I don't know what it is. I mean, I love, you know, we love the kid in the, in the bunny outfit here. This is the, let's see, the Watson twins. Is this the Matson? I forget what they're called, but they're these two brothers that do this guitar drum thing. I saw them open for Marco Benevento recently in, in Mill Valley back when there was live music. Mm, yeah, uh, and, and also, uh, but yeah, I'm guessing just some some rando backyard SoCal party. I don't know, like what's going on. There's nobody really there, but there's another photographer. So so classic of Neil. Yeah, and and one of the things I like about his music stuff, and this got mentioned before, is that it kind of, it almost doesn't matter who these people are. It's 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 a really good photograph in its own right, even if 
you know, even if we had no idea who they were, and it was just some people playing music outside, you know, there's the, there's the, the layer of who people were professionally and how he was a part of that. And then there's also this other sort of fine art photography context where it's just a really good, a really good picture. Uh, the next one of the guitar and the vans, that looks like it's in that building that- Same cottage, yeah, that's in- I Yeah, the same, the same uh, one, it's the same shoes. Yeah. I'm thinking that's probably a digital picture because it's a little bit later, but I'm not, I'm not positive. Uh, I know he didn't, he didn't love the transition from film to digital, but it's so, it's free and it's practical and it's- It was very noticeable to us and to Ricky and me when we were going through all this stuff and looking at it, it, it really changed his, his vibe as a shooter um, going to that, that digital format. Um, one of the things that we were talking about, I think earlier the other day, was that you know when you would shoot film, there might be one frame or two frames, and all of a sudden you're shooting digital. Now you're seeing ten frames of the same thing instead of him just like almost capturing that magical moment that just existed for that split second. It's you know, lasting a little bit longer, and I think that we've all kind of done that with our digital cameras. Right, it just just was much more discriminating, and and also you know we had to pay for those um, taking stuff to the lab, and and he. He shot so much stuff, and it 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 could add up. And I think it made I think it made us more careful about what we shot, and really waiting for that, mm -hmm. that moment that we wanted, waiting for somebody to turn their face toward the light or something to kind of move into it into a, a spot where it looked good. And that became it just naturally became sort of more expendable. We had a lot of conversations later. One of the last conversations that I had with him. Um, just about, he was going through old proof sheets and, and just saying, God, I wish I could, I should just go back to digital. I wish I could, I mean, go back to, to film. It was just so, I just love it so much. And it just has a, so much depth and a totally different look. And, and we're just kind of, uh, we're just sort of wistfully talking about the old days with the, and, and, you know, of course he, you can do that. You can go back to film, but it's just, um, it's hard to even find, you know, a lot of the labs are closed. It's just a lot more of a process. So when you have that digital option, you end up using it, but I don't think it was his favorite thing. And then the uh, people on the fire escape, that's a, that's, I'm not sure where that is. Maybe that's New York or something, yeah, but that's, New a, York, yeah. that's a really nice one. Another, another pair of roads. Love this shot. To me, this just says so much, the roads coming together and then separating again and just being in the middle. There's, to me, this just says so much. And another nice symmetrical one with the center composition. And this woman in the uh, woman in the coat, that's a, a Robert Frank looking one there. Um, really beautiful. This guy with the, uh, with the shopping bags, that's on Figueroa over here in Highland Park. Again, as well, there was a swap mall there, an indoor swap mall. And that guy's walking down the street in front of it. And again, just walking around his, you know, this was when he was home, but walking around the neighborhood and kind of experimenting with stuff. And that's pretty, pretty early in the manual camera journey. The next one as well with the stroller, that is, that's right outside his apartment in Highland Park on a side street there. Um, woman looking, there's a little hill, looking down the hill. This next one, I guess it's like a, like an Easter parade or something. That's really, that's another great documentary type thing. Um, I should probably speed up because I'm using a lot of time. But uh, yeah, some airport stuff. I, this this one of the silhouette with the countertop. I know he was really proud of that. That was that was one that he liked a lot. I think he. Um, always had that in in folders of his favorites and this one with the shadow and the the missing head on the statue and then him next to it um and the contrast with the white of the statue and the and the black shadow um that that white wall coming through it and the dark above and below that i really like that uh this the next one with the with the discount clothing that's i think that's probably also in highland park the coldest beer in town another neon sign that's over here I shot some pictures of him for uh, his, it was called Return in Kind, one of his solo albums. We were next to that, that liquor store there. 
And um, the uh, get the trimming pot photo here. It's a little I think Jonathan Rice, and I'm not sure who. Jonathan who, Wilson. Or I mean, sorry, Jonathan Wilson. Yeah. Um, Farmer Dave. Yeah. yeah, Farmer Dave. And uh, and then this cool, really great color one with the with the flowers and all the stuff outside this this building. We've got more. I really talked for a long time about those earlier ones. Got more Japan here. Um, a lot of great Japan stuff, more people traveling, trains, and um, somebody taking a picture on the sidewalk with him reflected in the mirror. I remember him telling me that that other picture that was in Christie's section of the U-Haul with him looking in the rear view mirror, I'm pretty sure that's when he was moving to Los Angeles. I think that's why he was driving that truck. Got it. Um, I think that's what he told me. Right. So I think we're through all your section there, Laura. Thank you so much for all of that insight. Um, just uh, amazing. And uh, it's just great to hear, you know, every one of us sort of comes into a different section of Neil's life, at least from when he sort of came out into the world as a professional musician and, and evolved into this, you know, image maker as well. So it's, you know, super cool. Um, all right, so our last um, guest here, um, is an amazing person. We have Piper Ferguson, and uh, Piper um, is an LA-based uh, commercial photographer, music photographer, uh, film director. She's made music videos, television commercials. Uh, she's worked with all sorts of incredible legendary artists like Merle Haggard and Beck and Tom Petty and Kenny Rogers and David Crosby and Coldplay, and the list goes on and on and on. And, and uh, wow. Um, you know, Piper's done a lot of really, really amazing things. And, uh, you know, in, in Piper's essay, um, she talks a little bit about when she first um, met Neil, and that's a really great story. But one of the things that I pulled out that she said, um, which is just so true about Neil, is that he said, Neil's curiosity about everyone he met and everywhere he went um, you know, and it's, it, it, it's just true, like, and that's why in my essay I also said that, you know, he didn't hide behind backstage doors or security guards or whatever. Like, you know, you met Neil and he started talking to you immediately, right? Like he wanted to know about you. He wanted to ask you questions. He was inquisitive. He was curious. Um, and, you know, when he met photographers, he was curious about, you know, what and where, um, you know, I've talked about this in the past where like with me, he was very curious, but there was this, you know, I think that he kept thinking of me as this professional photographer that, that he couldn't ask questions to because he was just learning. And I never felt that way about, about Neil. And so, um, Piper and Neil had that through line of music and photography and they were creative together. Um, uh, Piper uh, directed a video for one of Neil's solo songs, which is super beautiful. Go to piperferguson.com and check it out. And for those of you just joining us, there's a Kickstarter campaign, kickstarter.com, and then do, do a search on uh, Neil's last name, Casal, and you'll find it. Please contribute. Please be part of it. Buy this coffee table book. Um, contribute to the record project. Let's keep Neil's work and his name alive. Um, Piper. Uh, this first photograph is backstage in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and it's Neil Young sitting in his tour bus. It's just such a great voyeur photo. Why don't you take it from here and talk about your relationship with Neil and photography and music and um, and anything else you want to talk about? And then okay, uh, the thank you, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, and thank you for allowing me and inviting me to be part of this book. I feel so honored. Um, I hope the music in the lobby
Um, the sort of Graham Parsons pants and the girls pointy boots, the black and white ones standing outside the door. There's, um, you know, I, I photograph, I have so many pictures like this. And the cool thing about photography as you know, his is very uh, retro Neil Casal style, black and white. And I have photos in my style, very similar where it's like, peaches boots and dj princess superstar and it's shot with a flash it's two in the morning it's at night but you know we're both kind of thinking in the same um 
realm of how we do our photography, even though his looks totally different and mine's very saturated in color and kind of punk rock a little bit more. I don't know, I don't wanna say that, but, um, but I just love how a photograph can be framed the same and it's a female artist, but then they look totally different. So I love that. Um, Crosby, you know, not the greatest turn tape. Ooh, sorry, I don't wanna say that. I'm gonna skip that one. Uh, I know Jim Scott meant a lot to Neil and he is in this beautiful spot that he probably spends the majority of his life. So I just like that he captured him uh, in that space where he uh, has done so much amazing work for so many people. Uh, I, I love this shot of Dan Horn leaning on there also very retro tour bus and I don't think Dan's really super psyched about having his picture taken all the time, you know, um, just these characters and obviously super talented musicians, but um, yeah, they're just all very candid and, you know, he probably did that to just be silly and he's not, you know, Neil never really, he toured with so many people that were in it for the right reasons. They don't want to be, I mean, I've worked with the Backstreet Boys. I'm not saying there's anything wrong, but they're not like posing, but they're posing in their own little funky, quirky way. They're not posturing, which is what I love about what he captures in his images. Um, you know, I'm not sure if this was uh, a posed photo or if he actually happened to just capture him there with the light on the floor, but beautiful picture of Chris Robinson. Uh, this is a great deep stop shot. Um, not sure what he shot it on, but just everything is, there's so much texture and so many patterns and so much going on in the image. But, you know, you see these lines from the, oh my God, I can't remember. I don't know what that instrument's called. Do you, Jay? The one that yeah, Farmer yeah. Dave is playing? I don't know what, don't know what it's yeah, called. Yeah, right. Sorry. The air, um, air accordion piano thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just love how much texture is going on in this image, but it doesn't distract you for some reason. So that was a Think something that I thought about that. There's nothing that's too much, even though it's a lot. <laughs> and we can see Neil on the end here. He must have set the camera up on a bag or something so he could jump in it. Um, the skiffle players, uh, I think the, uh, Jay mentioned they meant a lot to him. It looks like they're on the LA River. Maybe they were doing a music video photo shoot, but yeah, it's a really fun photo. Um, this is a photo with Ben from Beachwood Sparks. And you know, it's funny about Neil here. This is hard to say because he's, he's, you know, Neil was so magnetic and everybody wanted to, I mean, he just, I would go to a club with him and girls would push me out of the way, you know? And he just, everybody wanted to be around him even if they didn't know who he was or what he did. He just had this thing that people gravitated towards fiercely and I just kind of feel like he got to this place where he wanted to sort of like darken his self a little bit so he didn't uh attract as much attention so he kind of was in in this picture he's kind of like childish and I don't know I just I just kind of I don't know why I get this feeling from this image because you know I think after a while, it's like, it's like being a celebrity. Eventually you just, you can't take so much. I, I don't know. This is hard to talk about. Um, this is George Porter on bass. You know, we, Neil and I were both always really excited to photograph people we were big fans of, and we would email each other photos and I'd be like, I have photographed Paul Weller. And, you know, he would send me people that he got to photograph backstage. That he was really proud of. And this reminds me of one of those photos. Um, you know, shooting from the hip, tour shot, love this photo, great composition, super cool. Love how light it is and white and there's not a lot of dark. Um, let's see, we've got, this is Jimmy Herring on the couch here. Just a nice, you know, reportage journalistic style backstage shot. He did a lot of that obviously because he was on the road so much. Um, I love this picture of Jackson Brown. It's like a face in the crowd. Um, I love facing the crowd photos and it just happens to be Jackson Brown. And I like that he didn't just 
I mean, he's probably always shooting with a 35 fix, maybe on a Leica, maybe on his Fuji, whatever he was using. You know, you can't just like zoom in on Jackson Brown, but you could have zoomed in on it after the fact, but I like that it's the full frame and, you know, you, the face in the crowd happens to be Jackson Brown. I like It really that. just tells um, a story about how intimate this whole thing is. I believe this is just shot at the mollusk. And, oh, uh, yeah, 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 definitely. You know, it's like, you don't expect to see Jackson Brown yeah, just kind of plopped in the middle of all these people. 40 people, like, you know, yeah. without security and blockers and like, you know, yeah. no, no, fo you know, it's just, that's just un, un, not normal. Yeah, I know Neil was also a really big fan of his, so I'm sure he really loved to get to be there with his camera in that moment. I mean, this is a killer shot. Um, and then this is Martha Wainwright. And I think, you know, you can kind of see that she was probably looking forward at one point, talking to somebody, having her sig, waiting to play. And then Neil probably was sitting there with his camera and she noticed, you could see that she just noticed him like, oh, you know, I, and that's just Neil. Um, beautiful photograph of Sarah Lee Guthrie. Um, you know, just looking very calm and beautiful and I don't know where they are, but yeah, gorgeous. Um, I like this picture of Chris from the Brotherhood because I know Neil took a lot of pictures of um, Ryan like this. I loved all those pictures he got to take of Ryan because Ryan really did, you know, he wrote his songs on a typewriter and, you know, he, he really lived the life. And uh, I think Chris is the same way. I mean, this looks like a set. If, you know, you could, you can't put that together. It's, it's just fantastic. The, the vintageness of it all, the retroness. And Ryan was like that too. He always had his papers and he was always writing and smoking and just these guys are the real deal. And Neil got to capture that. And, you know, in 2020, there's not a lot of that going on. I mean, there is in his world, but not everybody gets to see it because there's so much of music's changed so much with pop culture and pop music. And it's very different. Um, I love this picture. This is Jason Crosby because, you know, you've got this just rock star standing, sitting behind this piano and then you've kind of got this crowd behind him. And again, a deep stop, probably a wide shot so that he could get that deep stop. It's not a shallow depth. And you, just seeing all the crowd and him, another face in the crowd, total rock star, so focused. Anyway, I love that. Uh, Robert Randolph, I know Gary manages him again, just playing his, uh, okay. I almost said lap steel. I'm glad I did it. Um, uh, yeah, great shot. I love this shot of, um, hang on. Uh, 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 Ethan Miller. E from Ethan Miller. Yeah. Um, Beautiful, candid photo, just, you know, in the moment. Uh, this is really cool because it's, you know, that real Eggleston vibe. Um, oh, the banal, the banality of life, you know, just kind of like, this is my experience right now. And it's just very banal, but beautiful. You know, you can turn it into art. Um, same kind of thing, just this is my experience and I'm finding beauty in my environment and it looks like a painting. I'm sure Neil checked in, sat down, dude walked by, click. I don't know, <laughs> I just think it's cool. Uh, again, this is, I don't know where this is. If this, this can't be a hotel, maybe it's some kind of bed and breakfast or whatever, but. I think this is the same beach cottage in Australia from that surf. Oh, trip. okay, or New Zealand maybe. Or New Zealand, uh, sorry, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the colors, it looks like it's shot on film. Everything about it is just, yeah, uh, the yeah, fact sure. that they would have that painting above the bed <laughs> and that Neil probably looked at it and just went, Okay, cool. Uh, you know, just again, very Eggleston, the banal life, the, but finding so much beauty in the colors. I love that. I love this shot too. Amazing. I don't know this young girl, but just so tough, so rock and roll. I mean, you know, he, he can only seem to attract these folks that really, he, he's like attracting his vision. You know, it's not like a little kid with 
you know, shorts and a hot pink bike. And he just attracted what he sees. Uh, I think Christy, you said these might be his dad's shoes. They look like his gardening shoes and you can kind of see the garden behind there. And I know Neil was just so enamored by his father. Um, yeah, I don't know a ton about this photo, but um, you know, shooting from the hip on the streets, New, maybe New York City, love that image. It looks timeless. It looks like it can be from any time. Um, probably Japan, skipping through. I saw, this is kind of funny that, um, it's kind of coincidental that Laura had the shot of like an Easter parade and I think somebody was carrying a cross. Again, maybe he's manifesting this type of image and uh, cruising down the street and Joshua Tree and happens upon this, who's not gonna stop and take this image. And the fact that he got to be there for it and have that moment, he's just, you know, an amazing artist and attracting these, these images. You know, I feel like photographers really attract uh, for their camera to get to capture that moment. Um, a little beloved, maybe tombstone, so sweet. I guess that is our face in the crowd shot, this man with his face sticking out. Didn't think, didn't, yeah. I think it's just his traveling. Girls having their time in the restaurant. I actually thought a little bit about pandemic because there's so few of them in there. Um, again, I love this woman. It also looks like maybe she was lightened up a little bit. Um, everything around her feels a little bit down and she's just, even though her energy feels kind of depressed or sad, or maybe she's nearing the end of her life, but everything about her is colorful on the outside. So I liked that he captured that. Um, no, it's just gorgeous passing through some nun he grabbed. I feel like Laura, you had this picture too and you said he was very yeah, proud did. of it. Yeah. yeah, 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 so cool. Trying to hurry up a little bit. Psychedelic shack. Is this the last picture in the book, Jay? This is the end paper. When oh yeah, this is the end the page. Inside of the book covers, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, we all wish we had a psychedelic shack to frequent. Um, I said this also in my story that's in the book about the red light, superior suds, wash and dry. It's, you know, I remember when Neil and I were cruising around New York and, um, you know, that we went to some bar and there was a red light and he instantly like jumped into this, uh, I don't know, it almost looked like a bathhouse we were in and it was lit red and we started posing and like, let's do an album cover. And that's the thing I was going to, I said in the, letter or story I wrote in the book is like Neil and I had so much fun hanging out and geeking out about photography and music so much and a lot of his work is really a lot of it feels very serious but he wasn't always so serious I mean he liked to laugh and and just be silly and play and not play not just play music just play in life so um yeah, even though a lot of his work feels very intense. Oh, okay. I'm going to skip through these. Love this one of the guy on the bike. Just the colors, the timelessness. So beautiful. Um, Nikki Bloom. Stunning, obviously. Can't help but take pictures of her, so I'm sure he loved that. Um, two of Neil's nearest and dearest they just are looking at him so lovingly and i know that those guys are brothers it's beautiful um, i'm gonna skip through uh napache they are this is such a beautiful photo i love this one of jonathan wilson because again he usually feels like a very intense person i don't know him but this is like the most relaxed image of him he just looks so calm and happy and chill and like you've got this water behind him that you can see where they are and i think there's farmer dave chilling with his shirt off and his glasses just 
killer comfortable Neil grabbed that image. So amazing. Beautiful. I don't know this woman feels very, this feels like a whole little witchy moment <laughs> to me. Um, let's see. I think Jay was mentioning if it wasn't for that Pepsi can, this would, could be England anytime. Neil just was really good at capturing moments where it just feels so timeless. This woman looks like she could be sitting next to Karl Lagerfeld in Italy having a, a cappuccino. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. All right. So we're getting late here. Thank you, Piper. That was awesome. Um, we appreciate everybody. Um, I think we have time for just like one or two quick questions. A uh, few things here. My show, Photos with Stories, next week, July 19th, same time, is going to be with a guy named Jimmy Crowley. He's a San Francisco photographer. Uh, Jimmy's not a professional photographer. He is a professional rock and roll fan with a camera, and he knows how to use it. He's been shooting rock stars for four or five decades. It goes back to the 70s with, with you know, Journey and Neil Sean with a big afro and, and uh you know, the big metal bands and stadium concerts and Led Zeppelin and, and The Who and on and on. And so uh, photos with stories next week. Um, Christy, I think you had a, an update on something I said earlier that you wanted to just correct on my uh, bio for you. Yeah, I appreciate. Um, I've been involved with BD Counter, but I'm not a co-owner. But I thank you for that. thank you for clarifying. So she wanted to clarify that. Thanks. She's not a co-owner. She's a she is a collaborator. <laughs> um, all right, Harrison, you have a couple questions for us, real quick, before we wrap this up. Yeah, I have a good one from Alexa, and Alexa, I guess this is a roundtable question. She wants to know how is going through all of Neil's photos helped with the grieving process. Well, I think the only person that really went through them all was Ricky and she didn't really know Neil, but so maybe how does looking at this book help with the grieving process for you guys? I'll, I'll start with that. I think for myself, even going back and looking at um, uh, this whole process inspired me to go back and look at all of these SX seventies and all these photos we took. I think I've scanned over a thousand of them already in his early um, photography career. And it's been, I don't know, for me, I've been separated from him the longest time. So it's really been helpful to go back and see who he was and became. And he's actually, you know, through his lens, he's actually still the same guy he was. So it's actually been really easy to connect with him through these images. So I feel really grateful to, um, I can still, when I see it, I can still see and feel him like looking down or looking out. So I'm super lucky and grateful that you and Ricky did this book. Anybody else? Um, let me think. The grieving process. I feel like it's not a grieving process I went through looking at the book. I feel like it made me just happier mm -hmm. about, you know, getting to see so much of his work and who he was. And yeah, I it, I guess that does help through the grieving process. You get to, we'll, we'll get to share Neil for the rest of our lives through his work and his music. And because of everything he's left, his legacy is with us forever. And that's super helpful. Yeah. And I have to say there has been a lot of grieving and, you know, I talked to Gary Waldman, his friend and manager and, and Michelle August, who's helping with the website and the foundation and whatnot. And, you know, we're coming up on a year anniversary of, of, of Neil um, leaving this mortal coil. And um, so for me, I think this is a really big gift to his fans. You know, mm -hmm. Neil had a hard time uh, realizing how much he was loved. I was actually saying that to Michelle recently, you know, with all the love we've been getting on the Kickstarter and all the comments and all, you know, everybody just giving so much. I mean, there was so much love for Neil and everybody loved him so much. And he was the one who just couldn't see that. Right. He had the hardest time with reconciling that so many people loved him and wanted to be part of his life. And, uh, um, you know, look at the lyrics in this song that the photo I have up here, Tomorrow's Sky is the name of the book. And this is actually the back cover of the book where we took this and put it over that shot that um, uh, Liz was talking about earlier from the surf section with the sunset in, the, in his van. And, uh, you know, my daughter, Ricky, was listening to a lot of his music while she was editing his photos. And so she got to really learn a lot more about Neil and whatnot. But 
I think that uh, this is a gift from all of us to all of you and all of Neil's fans. Um, all right, let's do one more question and then we're gonna wrap this up. All right, we got one more. So we touched on this a bit earlier, but where can we purchase the book and some of other, some of Neil's other photos? All right, I'm just gonna jump in there on that. So we have a Kickstarter campaign, go to kickstarter.com and search Casal or Neil Casal. Uh, very easy to find. You can also go to the website, which is the Neil Casal Music and there's a donate button that'll take you to the Kickstarter also. The Kickstarter only has about um, eight, seven days left on it. So if you have not uh, been part of this yet, go on it. Please support this. This is going to do good things. This is in Neil's name. This is in Neil's honor. We want to we want to um, get this out there. We want we don't want Neil's work to just disappear. We want this to be part of our lives forever, whether it's his photography, his surf stories, his music, all of this. And that's what the Neil Casal Music Foundation is going to be. There will be benefit concerts over the years um, to raise money for it. There will be people gathering to talk about Neil. Um, on the Kickstarter campaign, you can also buy some of his photographs of some of the packages. I believe that also in the book, we actually say if you want to purchase any of Neil's photographs to hang on your wall as art, there's an email address that you can email to. So when the book comes out, also just go to the Neil Casal Music Foundation.org and send an email. Michelle or Gary will get back to you, but we, it's another way we want to share his work. Um, and we also want other people to um, have that work. People buy photography from pho photographers because those images resonate with you and you want to look at them on your wall. They bring you joy. They bring you happiness. They connect you to a person that you had a connection with, whether it's a musician, that's a picture of a musician or a picture of a, a wave uh, on the ocean, like the cover of the book and what Ricky was talking about, our friend Josh, who had that blown up big in his, in his bedroom in Florida. So um, all of that will help support the foundation. We really appreciate you listening to all of us. Um, and all of us are easy to find on social media. Christy Coleman, Piper Ferguson, Laura Heffington, Ricky Blakesburg, um, Liz Pepinsilva. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you for watching. Please support the foundation. Uh, join us next week, Photos of Stories with Jimmy Crowley. And then we do it every other week, usually every other Sunday. But because I skipped Fourth of July, I'm doing Two in a row, August 2nd, we'll have Rosie McGee, one of the original Grateful Dead photographers in the 1960s. Um, thank you, beautiful women of Friends of Neil Castell for contributing to this book, um, doing what you did, uh, uh, giving us your feedback. Um, everything you did is just so amazing. All the words that you wrote is incredible. Um, Neil Castell or hashtag Neil Castell forever. Um, love you all. Great to get to know you. Let's, let's keep moving forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye, guys. <laughs>